Awesome, awesome. Well, welcome to the gathering. I am glad that you are here. My name is Tom. Everybody say hi, Tom. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to look to the person next to you. Just look over right there. Make eye contact with them. Look at them, look at them, look at them, look at them, and go, man, you look good. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Pastor John already mentioned that, so the sales pitch is over. Hey, my mom read that book. She really enjoys it, so that's, that's an endorsement right there. But um, this is the second service. I heard this is the quieter service. Yeah, so I need, I need your help. This is 100 proof water. I was always wondering what, they, what pastor drinks up here, but it's actually just water, I promise. That was, that was a joke. Uh, my family is here, um, and uh, they don't always get to be in church with me because I travel and speak from place to place and do different things like that. And so um, I'm super honored that my family is here. I want to introduce them. I have a picture of them. Um, so the guy in the middle, that really is me with a beard. That was like two weeks ago. And um, don't be jealous, it'll be back in like two more weeks. So uh, it's just how that works. It's like the Santa Claus, just kind of shake it out and there it is. But um, my wife there in the middle, um, uh, she keeps renewing the contract this month. We were married 24 years. Yeah. I know that's hard to believe. We actually couldn't rent a car when we got married. We were too young. And uh, so, the true story, I promise. Um, over on my far left, your right, that is our youngest daughter, Britton. She's a junior in high school, 16, driving, thinking she's in charge. Pretty much is. Um, and then uh, on, the far, on the far right or your left is our oldest daughter, Kylie. Kylie, um, she, we were such great parents that she had to leave the country. Most kids just have to leave the house. She left the country. She, um, she attends college. Uh, she's finishing up her undergrad in England. We're going to go visit her for Christmas. So, yeah, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty amazing. Um, uh, that sounds way more bougie than it is, I suppose, but it is what it is. Um, we, are, we are honored to be here. I'm honored to be here and share. Last service was incredible. I'm, th I'm believing that God is up to something and going to do something powerful in this service. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to uh, Pastor John and Cindy for um, not just pastoring all of us, but since we've been here kind of opening and uh, welcoming our family home as we, um, we've just been wandering in the desert like the children of Israel. And we're like, what are we supposed to do? Oh, the gathering. There we are. We actually found, we actually found our church on Instagram. Can you believe that? That's how, that's, how we, that's how we found it. So if you're not following us on Instagram, get the app and follow us on Instagram. There's another, there's another app plug, but uh, um, get that. Today I want to spend just a few minutes in God's Word about um, a really powerful moment with Jesus. You know, he had these really, really powerful encounters, and some of us have our favorites. I don't know how long you've been around church or how much you know about the Bible or those kinds of things, but this is a really powerful encounter that Jesus has um, with someone that I believe relates to all of us. And what I want to talk to you about is how our story matters or your story matters. We all have a story. Some of us are more scandalous than others, <clears throat> but not you, the first service people. Not, not you, not you. But we're going to go join Jesus for dinner in Luke chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 36. There was a very uh, wealthy and influential man who thought he would kind of chummy up to Jesus and be like, come to my house. We're going we're gonna to cook this big, huge buffet for you, and we want to have you over for dinner. And so we pick up the story at verse 36. Luke chapter 7. It says this, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, and so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral, somebody say, uh-oh, right? When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. And she knelt behind him at his feet weeping. Now you got to imagine the way that they would lay at the dinner table is probably different than how they do it at your house. I mean, they don't do it this way at my house. They probably don't do it this way at your house, but they would actually lean forward with their feet reclined behind them, right? And so she crept up, she snuck up on Jesus and uh, was behind him 
And um, she, she knelt there behind him weeping and her tears were falling on the feet of Jesus and she wiped them off with her hair. And she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited uh, Jesus, when, she, when he saw this, he said to himself, so he thought this privately, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him because she's a sinner. What kind of woman this was. Here's kind of the background of this immoral story. Some would say, um, as, uh, as other translations, different versions say that this, she possibly was a prostitute. She pros- possibly was, was a, 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 a woman of the night. Whatever kind of label you want to put on that. But whatever it is, she was scandalous. She had a past. She was shady. She wouldn't, uh, was, was taking a risk to be in proximity with Jesus Jesus and with this Pharisee, and everyone was shocked that she was even in the room. But Jesus wasn't shocked. Jesus knew, I want you to hear this more than anything else. Jesus knew exactly what type of woman she was. And he knew a little bit more than even that. We're going to get into that here in just a second. But what is the significance or what is the elements of our story that matters, of your story that matters? And as we get into this, I just want to kind of throw out this clause real quick. I'm going to get into my personal story. And um, for moms and dads in the room, I just want to forewarn you that my story is um, PG-13. It's, it's scandalous. It's shady. And um, I I just want you to be forewarned, we're going to talk about that. My daughter's in the room today, right, that sort of thing. So we're going to talk about some PG-13 stuff. We won't go beyond that. I could, but I'm not here to brag about those things. I'm here to brag about Jesus. But I just want to let you know that, that you can proceed according, however you feel you need to, but um, we're going to go there today. How is it that our story matters? Well, number one, I want to talk about the impact of a story. See, Jesus, in this a situation, this immoral woman or what type of woman she was, he looked past the implications and saw the impact of her story. He looked past the implications of being known and associated with a woman like that. I put that in quotations because Jesus had a reputation, like the T. Swift song. That's Taylor Swift for those of you that have been living under a rock. Um, He had a reputation where they accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard, um, which is like church language for being a drunk, Um, and, and, and hanging out or friends of sinners. He knew the implications to his own reputation of being in the room with a woman like this. What if, what if they accused Jesus of something inappropriate? What if they started to think he ran with that type of people, but he looked past the implications and he saw the impact of her story. He saw the impact of not who she was, but who she would become. In the rest of this story, continuing this on in Luke verse 40 of chapter 7, Jesus answers the thoughts of this Pharisee, man of this leader, and Jesus answers his thoughts. It literally says this, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces of silver to the other. But neither of them could pay back the debt. So he kindly forgave both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who he canceled of the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. See, a lot of labels, a lot of tags, a lot of identities had been laid on this woman. A lot of reputation had been thrown on her. 
Now, you might not know what to look at me today, but this is not what I looked like the first time I came into church. See, the first time I came into church, I was 14, and um, I, I was um, living in the Central Valley of Northern California, a city called Stockton, 209. Anybody ever heard of Stockton? All right, all right. See, you know I'll cut you. I will cut you. Highest murder rate per capita of any city in California. That's where I grew up. I started dealing drugs, running drugs, making a lot of money all through junior high school. First time I came into church, I had rings on every finger. I had necklaces all around my neck. I looked like a little white Mr. T. I started going to church because there was cute girls there. Actually, I started going to church because I was caught having sex with my girlfriend and her family made her go to church. So I started going to church. When I showed up to church, I had girls on both sides of me and there was cute girls there. So I kept going. See, the gathering does a little different here. We do Christmas in the park there. They had cute girls. That's just, that was the outreach model that they had. They didn't know my name when I showed up to church. Uh, And so they got on their little security system. They had to have security there. We got security here. We're more sophisticated. We got little FBI earpieces there. They had little walkie-talkies. Attention, hormones on campus. They didn't know my name, so they just said, hey, hormones on campus. And they, they just labeled me hormone. Parents wouldn't let me hang out with their daughters. Parents wouldn't let me hang out with their sons. Parents, I, was a, I had a reputation for being a bad influence, a corrupter. My, my teacher said I would end up either dead or in jail. Because of where I grew up, I was dealing drugs to, I would be with jocks over here. I'd be with hardcore gangbangers over here. I'd be at college frat parties. I remember I'm in like uh, seventh and eighth grade. I would be in these high school. I was jumping around and everywhere I would go, whether I was at home or at, in this case church or with friends or wherever I was, all these labels just kept getting put on. All these identities of who I had to be or become or act like or behave like. This woman came with an identity and a label of being immoral, of having a shady past. But Jesus looked past the implications of being with someone with that label. Looked past the implications of the scandalous story and the scandalous past. He looked past the implications and saw the impact of who she would become. I'm often just mesmerized by the scripture in Hebrews Chapter 12, verse 2, it says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That for the joy set before him, I just broke my macro count and had communion. For the joy set before him, his body was broken and his blood was shed. I thought, what joy? There's no joy in the piercing of his hands and the stabbing of his side. There's no joy in a crown of thorns being pierced through his skull. What joy? It wasn't for the joy of the cross and it wasn't for the joy of who I was. It was for the joy of who I would become. It isn't the joy of the labels that you've been given. It's the joy of who you would become when you recognize Jesus looks past the implications of your story and he sees the impact. I don't know if you have the same labels I had. Maybe you've been given other labels like cancer or divorce, failed business, kids leaving home. I don't know what labels have been put on you to where you think Jesus no longer wants to be implicated with you. But he sees past the implications of your broken, messed up, scandalous story and he sees the impact of who you will become. There's the surprise of the story. The surprise of the story, verse 
47, we pick it up. He says this, I, I tell you her sins that are many. See, he, he, knew, he, he knew all about it. Her sins that are many have been forgiven. And so she has shown me this great love. But a person who is forgiven a little only shows a little bit of love. Verse 38, then Jesus says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table said amongst themselves, who is this man going around forgiving sins? And Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He talks about the greatness of our past, the brokenness of our story, elevates our level of love. You might hear a little piece of my story and go, man, this guy's selling, running drugs at 14. Yeah. See, the first time I got high, I was seven, and I stole them from my dad. I have three sisters. Believe it or not, I have a twin. That's scary. <laughs> you don't know her, trust me, it's scary. They were quick to rat me out as soon as my dad got home and I got in trouble, but I got in trouble not because I got high. I got in trouble because, and I quote, you don't steal from your old man. That's what my dad told me. Hey, you don't steal from your old man. I got in trouble not for getting high, but for stealing his stash. And so I was grounded for the week while he and my mom went to work, which didn't happen. I wasn't grounded. I grew up like that. And before you think it was an episode of Cops, it wasn't that dramatic, or at least I didn't know it, how dramatic it was because our dysfunction became normal. I was messing around in school when I was in the fourth grade. I was nine years old, and uh, my, the teacher called and said, um, Mr. and Mrs. Hamill, uh, that's my parents, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hamill, would you help us? We, we can't control Tommy and um, we need some help. If you could get him under control because he's leading the class and, and he decides if it's a good day or it's a bad day or whatever. And so we need some help um, with Tommy, but, um, but he's a little out of control. And so uh, my dad hung up the phone. I was asleep in bed already and he came into my room. And um, uh, while I was sleeping, he began to beat on me in my sleep. And the next day I went to school and they, um, the, the school knew about it. And so they called the, they called social services and the cops and all that kind of stuff. I remember I was sitting, I was sitting in this, this couch in this big window pane when um, it was like the SWAT team. These, these cops and unmarked cars rolled up on our lawn and all this kind of stuff and just all chaos broke out and they pulled me out of the house and um, I had to go to this clinic and they, they would never do this today. They would never do this today, but they, they, um, they stripped me naked and started measuring and taking pictures of the bruises and the markings and the handprints that were left on my body. And I'm just paralyzed. I don't know a single person in the room. And uh, I had, they, they took me out of the house and they wanted me, um, they wanted me to go into like foster care and um, um, group homes is the word I'm looking for. And I was assigned a state social worker, her name was Susan, and they, uh, Susan was talking with me and working with me, and um, they were trying to find a place I could go live, and I, I didn't want to go anywhere else, and I just asked her, I said, hey, Susan, if I go back and live with my parents, can my dad ever, ever hit me again? And she, she looked me straight in the eye. I remember I was at this wooden park bench at Mary Graham Hall in San Joaquin County, and um, I, I remember making this decision, the fourth grade, nine years old. She said, Tommy, if, you're, if you go back and live with your parents, if your dad ever hits you again, he's going to go to jail. And I made the decision right then and there. I said, send me back. I'm going to make him pay. And revenge, bitterness, and anger took over my life. And from the age of nine to the age of 14 and a half, I did every drug I could get my hands on. I was mean and abusive, a bully. Um, I, I can't even tell you all the laws that I broke. I, it, it, was, um, it was insane, honestly. It really was just mind-boggling. It seems like I'm telling another story from another lifetime, somebody else's story. 
but uh, I've been in drive-by shootings and gang fights and knives and uh, every, everything that you can imagine um, and maybe have seen in movies that I wouldn't even mention here. I did it. And on January the 14th, 1994, I was laying in my bed, high on LSD acid I got from a Grateful Dead show. Some of us are old enough to remember who they are. Go, Jerry. Everybody else is like, what is he talking about right now? It's no worries. As I'm laying there in my bed, I'm contemplating everything that was going on in my life. See, the cops were showing up at my door. The cops were showing up at my school. I was getting pat-downs and drug searches and... All these things were happening, and I just thought I was so slick and smooth, but my life was spiraling out of control. And I had come to the conclusion after attempting suicide twice that it wasn't my fault that I was living this life. I was dealt a raw deal. I didn't deserve any of the things that was happening to me. And so I came to the conclusion the only way I was going to be happy was if my dad was eliminated from the picture. And so I planned that I would go into his room in the middle of the night like he did to me and wake him up and I would end his life with a nine millimeter gun that I ordered through my drug supplier and it was to come in five days. When I first started going to church, there was this big ugly youth pastor that would come up to me every Friday. We had, they had youth group on Friday night. There's like 300 kids there or whatever. And um, this big ugly youth pastor would come up to me and say, Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. And I was like, man, you don't even know me. I would leave that youth group and I would go on these weekend bengers and all these kinds of things. I'm like, you don't even know me. God doesn't want to do any, have anything to deal with me. I don't want anything to deal with God. I'll just sit in the back row and mess around a little bit and leave your little, your little church service thing to you, right? That sort of thing. But he was relentless. He would just come up. Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life. As I was laying there bed again January the 14th 1994 I'm thinking about all these things and I began to hear the words of that youth pastor Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life and I had never prayed before ever in my life I had not prayed one time I didn't I didn't even know if I believed in God but I was laying there thinking about everything that was happening and everything that was going on and I, I'm high on LSD drugs and I'm I'm definitely awake. I'd taken enough to stay awake for 24 to 48 hours and they were working. I did them all the time and suddenly I'm hearing the words of this big ugly youth pastor. And so I prayed for the first time. This is, I don't know if it was the right prayer. It wasn't sophisticated. I didn't have Bible knowledge or anything like that. I just said, God, if you're real like that youth pastor says you are, change me. I don't like who I am anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Friends, I'm here to tell you that it was in that instant Jesus came into my room, delivered me, set me free, put me to sleep. I woke up the next morning completely sober and freaked out of my mind because I was like, what just happened? This is not how these drugs work. Suddenly the sky was more blue than it had ever been. The air was more fresh than the Central Valley pollution air of California had ever been. I could breathe. It was like a weight had been lifted off of my chest and I was just kind of floating through the air and I didn't know what happened. All I knew is that I didn't want to have anything to do with all the stuff that I was doing. That youth pastor, I would call him on the phone, you know, like, did I tell you I grew up in the hood? I just want to make sure you understand that, because I'm not endorsing this, Pastor John. I'm not endorsing I'm just saying this was me, okay? This was me. He, he gave me a Bible, and um, um, he would say, hey, start reading in the book of John. And so I'd call him on the phone, and I'd be like, where in the blankety blank of this book is John? I had never heard any of this stuff before. He'd laugh, he'd be like, we'll work on your vocabulary, but it's about here, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Six months later, that youth pastor had me get up on a stage for the first time and share my story and preach to those 300 kids. I told him, man, I didn't get saved to be a preacher or anything like that. I was shy. I had to use drugs to come out of my shell. And he basically threatened me with my life and said, you're going to preach this week. And I said, no, I won't come. And he gets real close to me and says, if you don't come, I'll kill you. 
Russell, don't do that here. That's how you youth pastor in the Central Valley. Not here, not here, not here. At 15 years old, I preached for the very first time and it was like the matrix. God spoke to me in an audible voice and said, this is what you're supposed to do with the rest of your life. And the way God said it to me, there was only one response I could give him. Okay. Because he said it with such authority and such gentleness that I knew I'd spend the rest of my life telling this story because of the impact. I've now literally been around the world. I think Antarctica is the only continent I haven't been on to preach. I've been in front of small groups and large groups. I think the largest group, not that you care, but just to talk about what God did, it was like 500,000 people was the largest crusade that I've ever preached at. Yeah. <laughs> 10 years later, I'm preaching on a stage just like this, telling a story just like this, and my dad is sitting in the back row. And I give an invitation like you're about to receive in just a moment. And he raises his hand and he makes eye contact with me and says, I want to give my life to Jesus today. Yeah. My mom made the same decision a few weeks later. I baptized both my parents as a pastor, right? Like all. When my dad passed away in 2014, I'm holding his hand. We're worshiping Jesus together. Why do I tell you that story today? I was given a label. I was given an identity of mean and anger and bully. And I had to come to the place where I decided I'd let go of the dragon, that I'd let God deliver me from that bitterness and that unforgiveness, that I would allow him to bring his blood into the wounds of my story and bring a healing that made an impact and is still making an impact literally around the world. Why do I tell you that today? Because I'm just some young uh, unknown punk kid from the Central Valley who has a story, but Jesus realized the surprise of the story, the implications of the story, and you've got those same surprises. You've got those same implications. I'm not anything special or greater or more insignificant or important. He just wants to use our story. This is what he says about this woman. This is what he says about you. This is what he says about me. He tells them this. If you keep reading the story, I'm not gonna take the time right now because I wanna wrap this up, but this is what he says. He says, wherever the gospel is preached, this woman's story will be told. Wherever the story of Jesus is shared, shown, demonstrated, this woman's story will be told. That's what he's saying about you. That's what he's saying about me. Why is Christmas in the park significant? Because it's just another event to keep us all busy? No, 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 no. It's so that the story of Jesus and the story of you can be shown and demonstrated. It's so that people can understand that he looks past the implications of people like that. People with that identity and that, that, that past and that brokenness. And you've been told some things that you thought did you in. But he's saying the story is just about to begin. Your story is just about to begin. I didn't even, I'm telling you, the first service didn't get this version. Because who's the real author of the story? Who's the real author of the story? I, I, I showed this, and so, this is so, so cool. I, I started a group of men, all, all business leaders, because we have to journey together. You can't do this thing by yourself, and I can't do this thing by myself. And so we all, we all went to forge knives up in, Flagstaff. Last service, I said it wrong and said Scottsdale was Flagstaff. Geographically challenged. I did mention I did a lot of LSD, right? Did you hear that part? I didn't mean to prove it to you today, but... We went to forge these knives, and when we got to the knife smith, 
we picked out this piece of discarded metal. He's like, hey, I got all that from the trash heap so you can pick out any piece you want. And I picked out this railroad spike. That's what this was. And uh, he said, all, all that's meant for garbage. So pick out anything you want and we'll do something cool with it. And so I picked out this railroad spike. And um, he said, as you repurpose this, you reauthor its story. You rewrite its story. And he said, and the way that you rewrite the story is you, you put it in this forge, this flame. It's over 2,000 degrees. And it was. I had to guard my beard. I had it then. And he said, the more time you spend in the forge, the fire, the easier it is to reshape. And God just spoke to me in that moment. And he said, in your story, I'm the real author. And I'm forging you into something useful into my hands. Where everyone else might have discarded you. Said you were a failure because of this reason or that reason. And maybe you felt like a failure. Maybe you had the, the label or the title. You had the identity of failure. And he's like, I'm, I'm reforging you into a mighty weapon. So that your story and my story can be told. And I look around this room, I see a lot of shady people. Better hide my wallet. I just say that because my daughter's in the room. I gotta hide my wallet. At 44, I've watched God heal, deliver, change, transform the messiest of people. This is what God says through Paul. I'm the worst of sinners. I got the worst story, but God's putting my life on display as something new to show off what he'll do if someone will say yes to him. Your story matters. Your story has impact. Your story has implications. And today the invitation is, will you submit your life to the forgiveness, to the forge of Jesus so that he can intertwine and twist his story in with your story so that you can make an impact like you never knew was possible with someone like you. Here's what the Bible tells us. I'm going to wrap up with this right here. Thank you, Pastor, for letting me share today. The Bible says that he did the hard part. He endured that cross so that we could do the simple part. Simple, but not easy. That if we would accept the penalty he paid for me, if I would believe that it was for me and I would confess or say out loud with my mouth, then I would be on this journey of having him forge my life. I don't know where your spiritual journey is at today, but I do know this. He wants to reforge your story into something that makes a mighty impact in your family, in your job, in your community, in this church, in this neighborhood. And you do something simple like I did on January the 14th, 1994. You pray a prayer that goes like this. Jesus, if you're real, like that crazy pastor up there says, would you change me? Would you forgive me? Would you take my old identity and make me new? If you just prayed that prayer online, if you would just put, I said yes in the chat, there'll be somebody that would follow up with you. If you made that decision here, listen, we don't think you have it together. You don't, I don't. If you thought this pastor had it together, you're wrong. But we journey together to figure it out, to be forged together. And so if you're making that decision today, please stop by the connection table or even better yet, we're gonna end this service with some mighty people that are ready to pray with you, partner with you, befriend you,
to help you with those next steps and you'd be able to come out of your seat and let them pray with you in just a moment. Let me just close with this right here. I got even with that big ugly youth pastor. I married his baby sister. And he's coming to my house for Thanksgiving. So <laughs> would you stand with me all across this room? I don't know your story, but I know this. Jesus knows exactly what type of person you are. He understands the implications and he wants to journey with you. If you'd be bold enough to make that choice, that decision, I promise you, I've never regretted it. Not that it's been easy, but I've never regretted it. Prayer team, if you would make your way to across the front real quick, I'm just gonna pray over you and send you out of here. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you love us in spite of our mess and our scandal and our craziness and our brokenness and our failure. That you understand the implications of being around a guy like me, a lady like this, a family like that, a guy like him. And you pursue us, you call us, and you forge us into something that makes a mighty impact. I thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you made that choice, these individuals want to pray with you. Connect out there. The book's out there. We love you. Go have an amazing week.